Mystery Wine brings you the taste book of Gregory Hood. Tonight, the Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to the adventure of the Beeswax Candle, another exciting story from the case book of Gregory Hood. I hope you're sitting back in a comfortable chair after a good dinner. Did you try my suggestion to start that dinner with a glass of Petri California Sherry? Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. When you pour yourself a glass of that Petri Sherry, just look at the color. A beautiful deep amber. Then hold that glass of Petri Sherry up to the light. Notice how clear Petri Sherry is. Just as clear as crystal. That, you know, is one sure sign of a good sherry. But only when you put that glass to your lips do you really know how good Petri Sherry is. It has a flavor that comes right from the heart of luscious, sun-ripened grapes. Oh, and say, if you like your sherry dry, you know, not sweet, Petri makes a fine dry sherry... It's called Petri Pale Dry. If you don't know which you prefer, the regular or the dry, why not try both? Don't buy one, buy two. But just be sure you always buy Petri. Monday night in San Francisco, and we have a weekly date with Gregory Hood and his friend Sanderson Taylor. Tonight's rendezvous is at one of this city's favorite and most colorful meeting places, the top of the Mark Hopkins Hotel. Let's join them there, shall we? Harry Bartell, how are you? Evening, Mr. Taylor. Hello, Gregory. Hello, Harry. Come and sit down. We were just discussing a story. It's really Sanders' story, so I'll let him set the stage for us. And uh, go ahead, Sandy. Well, Harry, though it's an adventure that happened last January, it's as vivid in my memory as if it had taken place yesterday. It all began one evening when Mary and I were driving home from a party in the Berkeley Hills. Mary, for your edification, Harry, being what Earl Wilson would refer to as Sandy's B.W. B.W.? Beautiful wife. <laughs> I get it. Go on, Sandy. We were driving the Packard convertible, but even with fog lights, we could barely see the white line in the middle of the road. Everything was a grayish blank. And though it was only a couple of miles from the party to our home, we managed, among the twistings of all those unaccountable streets in the hills, to get completely and utterly lost. I didn't dare drive beyond the pace of a somewhat depressed and anemic snail, and as we crawled along, I prayed that the white line would lead us somewhere from here. Sandy, this fog's rather exciting, isn't it? It doesn't make driving exciting, Mary. I can hardly see the white line. I'm afraid we're lost, darling. We? Like a dream world. The kind of night when anything could happen. A night for adventure. You sound like Gregory. All I want is home and bed. Oh, that's nice, too. But tonight I think it's rather gay and romantic to be lost with you in the hills. Hmm, after seven years of marriage, darling, that's very flattering. Listen to that man playing the clarinet. Isn't it good? Oh, excellent. I wonder who lives around here that plays like that. Sounds like a professional. Darn it, even the street lights are off. Oh, power failure, I guess. Hmm, my, but it's quiet. The sort of night that... The devil's that? Somebody's in trouble. Stop the car, Sandy. But, darling, it's the middle of the night. We can't see a hand in front of us. Stop the car, Sandy. That sounded like a woman screaming. Come on, Sandy. It came from this direction. Well, wait for me, Mary. Wait for me, darling. Where are you? Mary! 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 <laughs> I've lost my wife in this fog. I thought she might have come here. She ain't come here. I'm not surprised you lost her. Why don't you be sleeping now as a metrician both sleep? Yep. Uh, I've lost my wife in this fog. She didn't come here, did she? No, mister. How'd you lose her? I'd like to learn the trick. Look, I have no time to joke. Do you have a phone? Nope. Still hoping for one, though. Well, uh, how about the house next door? Mrs. McIntosh lives there. She's got a phone. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, 
Oh, you poor man. Of course you can use my telephone. It's over there. Oh, thank you so much, Mrs. McIntosh. This is no night for a young girl to be running around by herself. You had a quarrel, of course. No, we didn't, Mrs. McIntosh. Oh, of course you did. I know how these things happen. When I was a young thing, I used to be mighty headstrong myself. Oh, but I assure you... Uh, police headquarters, please. Uh, Mrs. McIntosh, we heard a scream as we were calling along. I stopped the car and... Police headquarters, Lieutenant King speaking. Oh, this is Sanderson Taylor. I'm up in the Berkeley Hills, and my wife just jumped out of my car and disappeared in this fog. What happened, Mr. Taylor? Did you have a spat? No, we didn't, Lieutenant. As we were driving along, we heard a scream. I stopped the car, my wife jumped out, and... and just disappeared. Okay, I'll be over in a patrol car. Oh, uh, where are you? Uh, oh, just a moment. Uh, what's the address here, please? 114 Ogden Drive. Uh, 114 Ogden Drive. I'll make it as fast as I can in this fog. I'll be waiting for you. And now I'll make you a nice, strong cup of tea. And then you can tell me what you're quarreled about. Mr. Taylor, we've been in every house on this street, and there's no trace of your wife. But Lieutenant King, she... She can't just have disappeared. Well, looks as if she has. You're sure you didn't have a row with her and she hopped out on you? How many times do I have to tell you that we didn't have a row? Okay, okay. Look, Mr. Taylor, it's nearly four in the morning. I suggest you drive to your home. <laughs> the fog's lifting a little now. Oh, but look, tell... If your wife does get near a phone, she'll be bound to call you or Yes, but us. if we... Now, just take it easy, Mr. Taylor. I'll bet she'll turn up before morning. <laughs> Good morning, Gregory Hood, Importers. This is Sanderson Taylor. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Is Mr. Hood there? He just left. Oh, Lord, I've been calling him all night. Do you know where he went? Yes, Mr. Taylor. He's down at the dock supervising the unloading of a cargo. Well, do you know the name of the boat or the pier number? I don't know the name of the boat, but I think he said pier number 16. Pier 16, okay. If he should call you, tell him I'm driving over there right away. <laughs> That's what happened, Gregory. I couldn't find any trace of it. Gosh, Sandy, I wish I'd been home. I flew my plane down to Del Monte last night. Came back early this morning. Oh, I must have called you 40 times during the night. I've been absolutely frantic. I have a hunch it's all right, Sandy, but let's step ashore and get to a phone. I've got an idea. Oh, uh, Lundborg. Yes, Mr. Wood. You take over the unloading. Okay, Mr. Wood. Be very careful with that Peruvian consignment. I've got a special client lined up for those Inca headdresses. Right you are, Mr. Wood. All right. Now, come on, Sandy. Now, let me get this quite straight. You checked at all the houses near where Mary got out of the car? Yes, as far as we know. As I told the police, though, it was hard to spot the exact area. We were completely lost in that darn fog. Then your only real clue as to your location was that guy who was playing the clarinet just before you heard the scream. Yes. You say he was a good player? Oh, top notch. I remember that Mary said he sounded like a professional. Then that's our only lead, huh? Oh, here's a phone booth. Do you have a nickel, Sandy? Sure. Who are you calling? Harry James is at the St. Francis. He may be able to help us. Oh, you mean he might know who the clarinetist is? Sure. If he's really good, Harry will know him. Now, uh, Mr. Harry James, please. Oh, it's a slim chance, Gregory. True, true, but it's worth trying. Oh, uh, Harry? This is Greg Hood. I know, I know I must sound like the crack of dawn. I'm sorry. Yes, I I'm in a jam. Perhaps you can help me. Well, my best friend's wife disappeared in a fog in the Berkeley Hills last night. The last time she was seen, somebody was playing a mighty sweet clarinet quite nearby. I thought you might know if there are any really good clarinet players living in Berkeley. You do? Yes, I will. N name of Bill Cooper, huh? Do you have his address, Harry? We're in luck, Sandy. Oh, he knows the clarinet player in Berkeley. Yes, he's looking up his address. Oh, uh, yes, yes, Harry? His address is 109 Martin Way. Much obliged to you, Harry. Yes, I'll call you later. We might have dinner together. Uh, so long, and thanks a lot. You have your car here, Sandy? Sure. Good. Then let's head out across the bridge and pay a visit to Bill Cooper, the sweet clarinet player. Oh, this is his house, all right. Does it strike a responsive chord, Sandy? Well, it's hard to say in the daytime, but this street leads off Ogden Drive, and that's where I ended up last night in the fog. Mm. I hope that Bill Cooper can help us. Yeah, so do I. Yeah? I, uh, I heard your sweet clarinet, and I just couldn't resist dropping by. Huh. 
You a musician? I play around with the piano a little uh, in an amateur way. Well, come in, come in. Thank you. I'm Bill Cooper. My name's Gregory Hood, and this is my friend Sanderson Taylor. All right, Mr. Taylor. Oh, I see you have a piano in here. Maybe we could try a little jam session sometime. Yeah, maybe. Uh, are you a professional, Mr. Cooper? Oh, no, no. It's uh, just my hobby. I'm a teacher of judo. That's an interesting combination. You yeah, bet it is. Judo's great stuff, you know. Gives you a feeling of power. Oh. Look, Bill, I, I hope you can help me. Last night, around 12.30, my wife and I were driving near here. We heard you playing the clarinet. Yeah, that's right. I was playing at that time. And suddenly, we heard a weird scream. My wife jumped out of the car to investigate, and I haven't seen her since. I'm absolutely frantic. Yeah, that's tough, pal. Uh, what can I do to help you? Well, did you hear that scream, Bill? You'd stopped playing a few seconds before. About uh, 12.30, you say? Yeah. Say, I do remember hearing a kind of squawk. I thought it must be the radio over the professor's. It certainly came from that direction. The professor? Yeah, Professor Meyer. He lives across the street at 112. Then let's pay him a visit, Sandy. I'm much obliged to you, Bill. Well, that's okay, Mr. Hood. And uh, when you straighten out on your mix-up there, why, come back and hit that keyboard. We might knock out a couple of hot licks together. Mr. Gregory Hood, so. I am glad that at last you have come to investigate the house next door. And why should I investigate it, Professor Meyer? It's a house of mystery. Strange things happen there. Things I, I do not understand. Lights and noises. And last night, when I am in bed, I think I hear a scream. You don't mean the house across the street, do you, Professor, where Bill Cooper, the clarinet player, lives? No, no. I mean the house next to me. It's supposed to be empty. An empty house in this day and age? That's a phenomenon. I understand in some ways it's tied up in a, uh, a state settlement, Mr. Hood. It cannot be sold until the ownership is decided. Professor Meyer, why do you say the house is supposed to be empty? No one lives there, Mr. Hood, but many times I've seen lights and movement there. I do not like it. And one night I think I hear... No, 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 it is, it is impossible. We'll check with you later, Professor. Come on, Sandy. Right now we'll take a look at an empty house that screams. <laughs> house looks deserted, Gregory. Yes, it does, Sandy. Front door's locked, huh? Yes, yes, but the lock's old-fashioned. I think the skeleton key will do the trick. I suppose I'm condoning a burglary, Gregory. I don't think they'll send us up the river on this one. Ah, open sesame. Come on, Sandy. Gregory, I'm scared. Supposing Take Mary... it easy, Sandy. Well, the house is unfurnished, and yet... Gregory! What, what is it? Footprints in the dust. A woman's footprints. Leading into the front room. Come on. Look, lying by the fireplace. It's Mary. Mary! Mary, go It's all right, Sandy. She's breathing. She must have been drugged. I'll run back to Professor Myers and call the police and get them to send an ambulance. Do that, Sandy, though. Before you go, I suggest you take a look by the window there. Huh? Great Scott. A bearded man lying on the floor. He's unconscious, too. Uh-uh. If you look closer, you'll see that he's wearing a knife in the breast pocket. A knife that's in up to the hilt. Sandy, I'm afraid we are now mixed up in murder. You'll hear the rest of tonight's story from the casebook of Gregory Hood and Good Dinner and tell you how to make a good dinner really great. Just serve that good dinner with a good Petri dinner wine. If you're having hamburger steak, chopped, stew, in fact, any meat or meat dish, by all means serve it with Petri California Burgundy. Petri Burgundy is a hearty red wine with a marvelous flavor. Now, if you're having fish or chicken, try serving it with Petri California Sauternes. Petri Sautern is a delicately flavored, subtle white wine. It's just perfect. And whether you serve Petri Burgundy or Petri Sautern, or both, remember you can serve them proudly, because Petri is the proudest name in the long history of fine wine. Well, Gregory, again you left me cliffhanging. What happened next? That's an easy one, Harry. Sandy sent for the police and an ambulance while I stayed in that deserted house. As soon as the ambulance arrived, we rushed off to the hospital with poor Mary and paced the corridor anxiously while the doctor was examining. Oh, why the devil doesn't he let me see her, Gregory? Easy, easy, Sandy. 
By the way, did the face of that bearded corpse strike a responsive chord in you? No, I've never seen the fellow before. I think I know him. The beard threw me at first. It must be recent. But I'm certain he's a refugee named George Renault. No. Mr. Taylor. Oh, doctor, is she going to be all right? Yes, Mr. Taylor. She's going to be all right. Oh, can I see her? For a moment? Yes. Uh, but no longer. She's exhausted. Mary. Mary, darling. Oh, hello, Sandy, dear. Hello, Gray. How do you feel, Mary? Awful. Rather as if I've been trying to rumble with a hurricane. Oh, you poor darling. Oh, don't worry, Sandy, dear. I'm really quite all right. The doctor says I'm suffering from shock, that's all. Uh, what happened, Mary? Last night, I mean. I don't really know, Greg. I, I ran down the street, turned the corner, and saw a light in the house. The only one that did have a light. The door was open. I walked in, and suddenly something hit me on the back of her head. And that's all I knew until just now. Oh, Mary. Except that squadrons and squadrons of twin motored butterflies have been buzzing through my brain. Squadrons of them. Uh, she's asleep greatly. Thank the Lord she's safe. Yes, we'll come back later. Mr. Taylor. Oh, hello, Lieutenant King. Uh, this is Gregory Hood. Oh, how do you how do, you do, do Lieutenant? The uh, doctor tells me your wife will have to stay in the hospital a couple of days. I guess so. I wish I could take her home right now. Well, I'm not at all sure you'll be able to do that when she's well, Mr. Taylor. Hmm? Oh, what are you driving at, Lieutenant? I may have to book her on suspicion of murder, Mr. Hood. What? <laughs> Oh, Lieutenant, are you crazy? No, no, but your wife may be. We found her fingerprints on the dagger that was sticking in the dead man's chest. That's the blow on her head, Lieutenant. She was not cold by a blow on the back of the head. Uh, that's her story, Mr. Hood. But I just talked to the doctor. He tells me there's absolutely no evidence of her having had a blow on the head at all. <laughs> back again, my friend, Mr. Cummings. Thank you, Professor Meyer. What, uh, what did you find out at the house of mystery, Mayor? Quite a number of things, Professor, including my wife and the corpse. Your wife and the corpse? I knew it. It is a house of evil. I also found this book, Professor Meyer. It was lying under Mrs. Taylor's unconscious body. I thought it would interest you. This is a 16th century book. The house of the mirror of Malevolence. This confirms my suspicion as to that house next door. This is a book. A book, a grimoire. What's a grimoire, Professor Meyer? I think Mr. Hood knows, don't you? I think so. It's a handbook of black magic. A collection of all the most evil and supposedly potent spells, isn't it? Correct, my friend. And this book, this mirror of malevolence, is one of the most celebrated and horrible of all grimoire. As a scholar, Mr. Hood, I would beg you to give this book to the university library. As a man, I say, burn it. I can do neither at the moment, Professor. I must study it. Within these worm-eaten covers lies the answer to murder. Uh, it's driving me crazy sitting around the house without Mary being... I know, I know. Did you call the hospital, Sander? Yes, yeah, she's fine, but Lieutenant King's still in residence there. We've got to do something, Gregory. I'm doing my best. While you were driving the children over to your aunt's, I devoured the mirror of malevolence from cover to cover. And? I'm confused, Sandy. This, this case isn't pleasant. In fact, it's very messy. We're mixed up in black magic. Black magic spells a nasty, vicious, evil mind at work. And it means even worse than that. Gregory, for Pete's sake, stop coming on the piano. Okay, Okay. I'm sorry, Tom. Oh, uh, sorry. I didn't mean to yell, Gregory. I know, Sandy. <laughs> what did you mean just now when you said it was vicious and evil and... And worse than that. Well, I was thinking what the police might imagine if they realized this was a black magic case. If that scream you heard last night was not a death scream, but some part of the Sufi ritual. Supposing Mary wandered in and something happened. Well, Sandy, wouldn't it be possible that she killed him herself? Gregory, you can't believe that. I couldn't, but Lieutenant King could, and I wouldn't blame him. What we have to get is a confession. From whom? Oh, I know from whom, all right. It's a question of how. If only this darn book would... Sandy, I deserve to be kicked from here to Sacramento. What are you burbling about? I've got the answer. It's right here in the book. Let me see. Yeah, here it is. Listen. I'm reading from page 96 of the Mirror of Malevolence. 
How you may make a murderer confess his crime. In a candle of pure beeswax, insert the cuttings of the nails of the dead man. Burn this in the presence of the murderer, and the spirit of the dead man will descend upon him and torment him until he do confess his murder. Gregory, I'm willing to ride along with you most times, but if you put any faith in that kind of stuff... Never mind that, Sandy. I think this is going to work. Get your nail clippers. Then we'll go out and find a nice white beeswax candle. After that, I'm planning on playing a hot duet with Bill Cooper, amateur clarinet player. I think we may smoke out a murderer. You came back, Mr. Hood. Uh, what do you want to play? Well, let's add lib, Bill. I might start from here. It's a little number I whipped up a few weeks ago. All right. You all set, Sandy? Oh, yes, Gregory. I'm all set. Okay, Bill. Let's see where you can go on from here. All right. Uh-huh. Oh, Bill. I'm very much in the groove. Now, Gregory? Yes, Sandy. Now. A beeswax candle with George Renault's nail pairing stuck down it. Put it out. What's the matter, Bill? Put that candle out. Grab him, Sandy. I got him. Put it out. Let go of me. Oh, no, Bill. We'll hold you so you can watch the candle burn. It's pretty, isn't it? You feel him now, don't you? The spirit of the murdered man has descended to torment you. Let me go. And you'll keep on tormenting you, Bill, as long as that candle burns. Get it out. Until you confess. Let me alone. Put out that candle. You you? killed George Renault, didn't you? No, no, I didn't put out that candle. It's going to burn, Bill. It's going to burn right down. Come on, Bill. Why not admit it? You and Renault played at black magic, didn't you? No. Oh, yes, you did. You admitted before that you had a taste for power. You thought you could get it that way. I did. Finally, didn't. you killed him because nothing can give you more power than human sacrifice. I did. Get him, boy. That candle, please. You did, Bill. And when Mrs. Taylor walked in on the killing, you slugged her with one of those paralyzing blows of the peculiar to judo. It left no mark, and you planned to frame her for the killing. You put her fingerprints on the dagger. Oh, I said, You're in for it, Bill. You can't escape. George Renault's murdered spirit has returned. It'll never leave you, never, unless you confess. We'll burn candles until you've forgotten what daylight looks like. Oh, no. Oh, God. Oh, God. Let me run out Throw it out, will you? Then I'll tell you everything. <laughs> Mary, darling, how are you feeling? I'm still a little woozy, Sandy, dear, but fine. And Gregory? Yes, sir? You are wonderful. Lieutenant King tells me that you saved me from a possible murder charge. <laughs> I think you understand how it was, sir. <laughs> Why should she, Lieutenant? Personally, I think you have a horrid mind. Uh, I'm just a guy who works on facts, Mr. Taylor. Uh, you two had got a nice, clear confession out of Cooper. He keeps saying the dead man tormented him. How'd you do it, Mr. Hood? By using a 400-year-old book. But, Gregory, you didn't really believe in that stuff. Of course not. It's pagan and horrible, but Bill Cooper believed in it. The only way magic ever appears to work is when the victim knows about it and believes it. But what made you think it was Cooper in the first place, Mr. Hood? For one thing, the fact that he'd been an instructor in judo. That would account for his being able to stun Mary without leaving any physical trace. But the real clincher was the scream last night. I don't get you, Gregory. Cooper said he thought it was the professor's radio. But there was a power failure in this area at the time. You told me, Sandy, that all the lights were off. Well, that's right, they were. Sure. If Cooper had been in his own house, he'd have been sitting in the dark. and He'd have known darn well that his neighbor's radio wasn't working. He lied flatly, and why should an innocent man do so? Because he was in the deserted house, lit only by candles and improvising on the clarinet. He didn't know about the power failure. But that didn't make a court case, and I have to scare him into a confession. Gregory, dear, you're a very remarkable man. Thank you, Mary. You're a very remarkable girl. I thank you for saving me from a gas chamber. Oh, think nothing of it, Mary. But I do. And I make you a promise. What is it, Mary? Whenever we have you to dinner from now on, I'll set the table with beeswax candles. Come. Candles without fingernails. And for the main course, Gregory, we'll have twin motored butterflies. That was some story. Uh, how did you know you knew so much about uh, black magic? I'll let you in on a little secret, Harry. I don't know a thing about it. The only kind of magic I know is what my old father taught me. He did the most wonderful act of sewing a woman in half. 
But it never works with me. Uh, you mean uh, you couldn't master the trick, right? No, it requires lots of practice. Oh, and you couldn't find the time? No, I couldn't find the woman. Oh, no. But, Harry, you must know a few pretty good tricks yourself. Mm, no, not one, Greg. Now, come on, Harry. How is it every time I come to your house, you dish up such marvelous meals and you're no cook? Ah, <laughs> Greg, that's because of the Petri wine. Uh, didn't your old father ever tell you what a good dinner wine does for any meal? Mm, it all comes back to me now. <laughs> and you know Petri wine is good wine. Why, it's got to be. Look at the long years of skill and experience that goes into its making. The Petri family has been making wine for generations. Wine making is their heritage. A heritage handed down from father to son, from father to son. So you can see why the Petri business has grown and grown, so that today the Petri family are America's largest independent winemakers. Yes, the making of Petri wine is a family affair, and the Petri family has every intention of keeping it just that. So you know the name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a trademark. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that Petri wine is and always will be good wine. Well, Gregory, which particular page of the case book are you turning to for next week's story? Next week, Harry, I'm going to tell about an odd story that took place in Hollywood some months ago. It concerns a noted columnist, an extremely garrulous press agent, <coughs> pardon me, and a very dead actress. I call the adventure Murder in Celluloid. See you next Monday, Harry. You bet, Greg. And in the meantime, if you hear of any place for rent or sale, will you let me know? Don't tell me you're looking for a place to live. No, no, Harry, it's for a friend of mine, a veteran who just got back. Believe me, this housing shortage is really hitting the returning servicemen hard. And if anybody deserves the break, they do. I think it's up to us to do what we can to see that they get first chance at any vacancy. Remember, if you have a vacancy, lend it to a veteran. Good night. Book of Gregory Hood is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Original music composed and played by Dean Foster. Gail Gordon plays the part of Gregory Hood, and Sanderson Taylor is played by Art Gilmore. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. The Casebook of Gregory Hood comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family.